Hi, it's I'm Ken Austin. Um, my little business is Kenny's Tuning. I've been a motorcycle mechanic since 1975 officially in shops and then some years before that where I just work on guys bikes if they'd let me ride them before I had a license and uh, was lucky enough to ride a 750 Norton Commando S that 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 pretty much set the tone for how I thought a motorcycle ought to handle like a bigger motorcycle because I was just a little kid and I could ride this thing with gusto and uh, yeah that was that was uh, that was the motorcycle anyway that was probably a couple of years before I started working in shops but but uh, I think I might have been good at physics I might be good at physics basic physics because um, you know, most of our machines, it's, there's leverages and there's proportions of things and you have to have some kind of instinct for that to, um, to be able to sort of sail on your own without just following rules and stuff. And um, I think I always had some kind of instinct for that. Um, I started working on things, exploring machines, trying to figure things out, make them work better when I was about five and onwards and thanks to my dad's HO scale model railroad tools and clocks and mixers and anything in the house and uh, later on I'd go to the neighbors and ask them if their lawnmower needed a tune-up in the spring and then they'd laugh oh no Ken the lawnmower is fine and others would say oh yeah okay well I'd take the lawnmower home take it completely apart and uh, put it back together and it would always run great but truly it never needed to be utterly taken apart but I needed to take it entirely apart to figure it out um, did stuff like that um, yeah so uh, starting in shops in 75 there was no journeyman tickets or any training or anything it was you know for me I got asked to work at a shop that was sponsoring me because I was racing my Laverta 750 SFC and um, so they thought I knew lots about Italian bikes and they didn't realize that bikes are bikes to me anyway but um, so I started working in shops and a, a bunch of my friends said that oh man don't do it like oh, you'll ruin motorcycles for yourself and I wouldn't say it was like that because I really enjoyed really enjoyed working in the shop like I couldn't imagine a more fun job uh, I was doing you know what was technically interesting for me and getting paid decent money hanging out with fun guys uh, one of the shops I worked at was one of the major drug dealers in Winnipeg and um, so the the police were always uh, on our phones and you know raiding the shop and whores were coming by for their cocaine and you know it was just a really fun scene for a young guy <laughs> bike shops bike shops were wilder back then than they seem to be now or else they hide it better now I don't know but uh, that was fun um, I worked at that place off and on for most of the years I lived in Winnipeg and uh, another big dealer, Corbett Cycle City. Um, they were mostly Kawasaki's. Great bikes. One of the greatest bikes I think still ever made was the KZ 650, which is, uh, I don't, can't remember what years they made those, like probably 77, 78, 79, something like that. And then they became a 750, but that was a really great bike and uh, stone reliable good power, nice handling, first really, really good Japanese bike in, to my taste. Now that people should be collecting those things because that, that was a good bike. Um, and uh, I did some, uh, I did some lighting for rock and roll bands. Uh, I worked for a place called West Sun Media out of Winnipeg. Um, and so I was just kind of like a laborer doing lighting setups and stuff but that was that was a fun gig uh 
you just work, you know, 16 days straight and get a day off and get thrown in jail often on the day off and then back to work again for 16 days. And, um, yeah, I've been thrown in jail in a few different towns just overnight. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that was good. It was like a, a, a job that made little sense uh, as far as a career sort of thing. Not that I ever had one, but, uh, it was, it was really fun to work, to do technical work with, with guys that were proficient at their, at their gig as well, like sound guys and stuff. And my other lighting guys I worked with were great. And, uh, uh, it was a good job, and, and somehow doing uh, lighting shows for rock and roll bands made more sense than almost any other job I could think of. It seemed more important. <laughs> I'm still happy about that one, although I could barely pay my rent with it. But uh, yeah, well, that was that job. And after a while, uh, I got persuaded to move out of Winnipeg and so I came here and uh, thought I'd make money in the oil business but um, I never did work in the oil and gas industry at all. I got here was looking through newspapers and, and reading things like seismic wanted seismic blah 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 guys and I'm like I don't even know what seismic is you know and I'm from the prairies and farms and stuff like that but uh, Happily, I didn't go down that route because I would have wrecked myself with white powder and drinking and <laughs> blowing paychecks. Uh, so what I did do was uh, I worked with Heinz Newman, who owned Elite Motorcycles. And uh, so he sold Triumphs and Italian bikes until the Triumphs became so ridiculously poorly engineered that we stopped dealing with them entirely and just focused on Italian bikes but that was those are some really good years there with Heinz and working on my my favorite engineering which is Italian engineering I think their their taste in engineering is the finest on the planet to my taste anyway uh, in, a, in a bunch of things they do and um, so I enjoyed that and Heinz and his wife Denise were really really extremely helpful with keeping me alive in those days because I, I came to town with 200 bucks on my motorcycle and didn't even have my tools the first days of work in the shop I was working with the toolkit from my Laverta I, I had a thousand triple by this point and uh, that's what I was working with for hand tools and um, yeah, my first day of work I was so hung over I was tossing my cookies in the bathroom like probably three times during the day and so hungover and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is not the best first impression on the, the, new, the new gig. But, uh, but they, uh, you know, Heinz uh, didn't mind that too much and uh, on we went. But uh, our little venture, there's just the two of us, it, uh, it got killed off by Mm, rather high prices being charged, I think, uh, along with, we, we, we were still having pricing based on the boom economy, but it was, now we're into the downturn years after 81 or so. The oil and gas business was really on hard times then. A lot of people left town. There was hardly any wealthy young guys rolling in off the rigs looking to blow money, so hard times for us. Um, went skiing for the winter. I, I, I want, always wanted to be a ski bum, so I went and became a ski bum for a winter at Big White. Short order cooking and skiing every day, living right on the hill. That was kind of neat, but I permanently sucked at skiing. I never did get good at skiing. Um, I, apparently you needed lessons and a coach and everything else, but so I, I never got there. But um, up to that point, like, I, I'd had a lot of police problems, uh, speeding tickets and dangerous charges and, and crashes. And, you know, I've hardly got hurt in my motorcycle crashes except for one that 
really just about did me in. But um, broke my neck and a bunch of hands and all kinds of stuff. But uh, um, I, it became obvious to me that motorcycles were running my life in a way I didn't like. Like, I owed everybody I could owe money to money. And the bikes were just demanding, it, it seemed to me. But um, since I think I've realized that I, I suffer from being OCD and I go down rabbit holes and I can't help myself. I don't even try to help myself, so this is a problem. But uh, so I, I quit motorcycle racing and even riding on the street because it was just frustrating. You're just watching for cops all the time and it was like, I just want to ride, you know. And so I, I traded motorcycle racing and riding in for mountain bike racing and just riding and uh, that was a great improvement in life. Got healthy, hardly, oh, almost quit drinking entirely, and hung out with healthier, happier people. It was a good change, and I could afford it. I could, uh, I could ride the highest end bike money could buy, and race at a really high level, and cost me peanuts. It was beautiful, a wonderful thing. So it was a great change, and what I was doing for work then was I then also quit working for other shops and started working for myself and uh, so I you know I made good money I had low overhead and uh, and I had low expenses so I had this great life uh, I wrote a lot and I ate a lot and I slept a lot I worked just enough to pay the bills and then get a bit of money together head off to the Kootenays and ride in the mountains explore new places it was great uh, but then also my race tuning got to higher and higher levels pretty quickly and uh, so then that it was like I had to choose to ride or to race tune so I went off to, to the big world of race tuning and uh, was traveling down east in Canada and, and then to, into the states doing some AMA stuff and um, that was good I learned lots uh, of I've always been competitive, so to put your wrenching up against other guys, the best guys in Canada and some of the best guys in the States, and see where you stand was interesting. Um, I found out that I was I was pretty decent compared to the other guys. Had a few guys that I'd consider peers or slightly above, but reachably above in the technical realm and uh, some good cats and that was that was interesting and I uh, did that for lots of years mixed with uh, mixed with some short-term shop jobs at Blackfoot Motorcycles and other places and uh, uh, the, the, the normal job is really hard to deal with um, like I don't think hu humans don't naturally turn on at nine in the morning and function at this level and then turn off at 4.30 or 6 or whatever the punch out time is day after day. You can make yourself do that, but it's not easy. And Yeah, so some of my early influences, um, when I was a little kid, my uncle Bob used to come by with his MGTD, I think, uh, some kind of open wire wheeled sports car. And I thought, wow, that's cool. And, and then I heard that my Uncle Bob did gym cannas or racing on airport circuits or something. And uh, But I think, actually, he was just doing that on a very minor basis. But in my mind, he was a race car driver, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a race car driver. And later, when I found out about Formula One, I wanted to be a Formula One driver. That's when I was first okay with not being the tallest guy in the class. <laughs> that all, all race car drivers are small guys. I'll be a small guy. I'm fine with that. But um, along the way, um, I had my own stuff going, my own mad interest uh, with little things around the house and all that. But I also had neighbors across the back lane that were drag racers and sprint car racers. And uh, I, I was a terrible leech. I hung around those guys 
I they couldn't shake me. I I washed parts in a little dish with Varsol, so much my hands were split and bleeding and stuff from the Varsol drying out my skin. And I did anything. I helped grovel under cars, helping little Kenny, helping lift transmissions in and stuff like that. I I I just drank it up. But one of those guys, Jim Patterson, was a really big influence on how to do clean mechanicing, like do fine work cleanly and how important it was to be clean with your work because uh, uh, I like to say that people are really good at eating shit but motors aren't you know like you got to be clean they can't clean themselves but um, yeah so that was that was a big influence and then um, other influences uh, like I've got my grade 12 and that's as far as I could stand being formally educated it was really annoying, the formal education business. Um, but I've read a lot of books. i uh, read magazines and books, technical books. I've got books from MIT, um, technical engine engineering books and stuff like that. But really the biggest influences in my reading were Grumpy Bill Jenkins had a book um, that you'd buy in a hot rod shop on, on tuning, you know, building race motors out of uh, small block Chevys. And so that book, there was a great deal of information in there that meant a lot to me. And uh, another source similar to that was Smokey Eunuch, who was uh, really top end, sometimes radical, always pushing the limitations of rules. They, they invented a lot of rules because of Smokey Eunuch, because of the crazy things he tried and did on stock cars. So stock car racing and drag racing influences, but both really fine engine tuners and inquisitive guys and uh, pushing out the limits all the time with these engines. Uh, they're very impressive characters and uh, I learned a lot about port shapes and things just from reading their books. Uh, um, another aspect about porting, say, fluid dynamics. I, I think a core interest I've always had has been fluid dynamics, and that can be air or water, any kind of fluid. So uh, I have raced sailboats since I was 14. So you've got one airfoil up in a really low speed flow and then you've got another foil, your dagger board, down in a much denser medium, like 800 times, I think. Water is more dense than air. So it's basically, your foil moving at sailing speed is moving at a near, somewhat like a supersonic airflow speed, if that makes any sense. So like the foil designs for the air and the water are radically different. So you get to kind of test two mediums at once and fluid dynamics experiment and that's how I largely saw sailing was an ongoing fluid dynamics experiment and uh, with no rules and nobody's looking over my shoulder limiting me at all and uh, that was that was really good but anyway that that kind of information or understanding helped with having an idea of what motors wanted to move air through a motor and uh, so um, that's so just another minor little bit there. Uh, I think, uh, you know, so I was race tuning from when I started racing myself in, uh, mm, what year would that have been? 1977, I think? 76 or 77 on my Liberta SFC, which was a superb bike to start racing on. Um, Maybe uh, how, how I got to have that bike or be interested in that bike um, was I owned a 550 Honda, which after riding a Norton as a little kid, riding a buddy's Norton, the, the Honda always felt like I was riding a little piglet. And it was the handlebars were like the front wheel was flapping around kind of separate from the main piglet. And... Uh, I thought this just doesn't impress me as to how a motorcycle like to me like the Norton feel was a nice low center of gravity like a kid could ride it aggressively and a beautiful 
your two wheels together all the time. You weren't having this shopping cart kind of front end business going on. And, uh, you know, when you ride a, a, any bike fast, you ride out of contact and smoothness and you ride into what I call dance mode. And that's where everything's shaking and jumping. And, you know, that's now you're actually going. So you ride, that's also, you're riding out of your chassis setup and it's time for a new level of chassis setup, but so therefore chassis setups are always evolving because you're always right out of the setup if you got any gusto. But um, so I was trying to hot rod this 550 Honda. First thing I did was buy tires, TT100s, and got rid of the ribbed front and whatever Japanese tires were on it. But uh, while I was buying tires, it was at this BMW shop in Winnipeg called BVW. Uh, I went in there and there's just this one guy there, their mechanic, uh, Bruce, working there. And uh, as I came in, I saw this orange bike sitting across the showroom in this sea of BMWs. And the BMWs were okay, but uh, they just didn't really interest me. But there's this orange thing with a fairing on it and this huge long gas tank. His little seat way back there and his little handlebars way up. I said to Bruce, like, well, how the hell do you even ride this thing? Like, like, how does a human ride this thing, fit it? And uh, I sat on it, and I'm all laid out. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, this is crazy. And, uh, and then uh, we talked about it a bit, and then he, he started it up. And that bike came into Canada and probably most of the world when you bought it new. It came with two complete exhaust systems. It came with a two-into-one open megaphone race pipe that was beautifully made, rubber-mounted, slip joints, everything, really fine piece. And a beautiful uh, sort of two-into crossover, two-into-two exhaust system with beautiful chrome-plated mufflers. It really, it sounded like a Dunstall pipes on a Norton, say. But uh, really nice, pleasant sound. But uh, anyway, this thing had the two into one meg on it, and he fires it up in the showroom, inside the shop. And wham, wham, he's revving it up, and the thing's dancing and shaking around on its center stand, and the hair's standing up on my arms. And I'm like, holy fuck, holy fuck! And uh, <laughs> I I went back to the shop every day for a week, like, and bought it on the Friday. <laughs> So that was how I got my first Italian bike. And part of what sold me on it was the owner's manual had parts diagrams so I could see how the motor was built. And, uh, you know, when, when you see a camshaft on a twin cylinder motor with four ball bearings and a, a crankshaft with five bearings, like this thing's built like a brick shit house. Like, you know, compared to a Triumph with two main bearings and a crankshaft whipping around stupidly in between them. Uh, it was a clearly a, a robust thing, you know, so I bought it and rode it home Friday in you know 90 degree weather early summer in Winnipeg in rush hour traffic and The thing was not set up Yeah, so I rode this bike home in the traffic and like the clutch is dragging the revs are hanging up because the carbs are out of sync uh, it was miles out of tune. It was like outrageous that they sold it to me in this state of tune, like ridiculous. But it was so bad that I thought, oh my God, I've made a terrible life decision. I've gone deeply into debt, which 3,500 bucks was for me at that time in 1976, you know, on peanuts wage. I don't even, I don't even remember what I had for a job then, but uh, you know, I'm not making much money. But, you know, so I barely get this thing home and I go, fuck, like, what have I done? What have I done? I, I came around this one little corner on the road back to our house that on the Honda, I'd pin the throttle there and get it to step out a little bit. And it would do this kind of feeble little, little slide. And, uh, and then, so I come around the same corner and I'm kind of mad at this Laverta that I went and sunk my self into and I come around this corner and I go I give it some lots of throttle and the thing goes completely sideways one way and I do the big giant step just about break my foot and then it goes totally so I did these you know several 
full, just about high side step outs and oh, oh, it has power. Well, that's nice. <laughs> and then uh, got home and then uh, clearly it was something in the raw, a diamond in the rough and possibly, but certainly was in the rough. So I thought, okay, I have to master this thing and I've got to tune it into submission and make it more user friendly. So I did that. I, I just, you know, went through everything, you know, ignition timings and synchronizing carbs and blah, blah, all the basic stuff that should have been done. But, um, and then I did some modifications to it as well. Um, things like, um, it had brake calipers sticking out the front of the forks, which a lot of bikes or some bikes had in those days. I think they were thinking like the, you know, the rotational load on the calipers would kind of pull, it was better having them pull on the forks and push on them was the thought, I suppose, but it wasn't really a valid one, I don't think, because what I noticed later on when I started to ride this thing aggressively was, um, so you ride into dance mode, alias tank slappers and shaking and jumping, and when you've got a heavy front end, when you've got calipers out there ahead of the steering axis, the more weight you have out there, once that mass gets moving, it's really hard to get it back with, you know, your strength on the handlebars. So I went, you know, I'm fighting a lot of mass here. I, so I switched the calipers, I switched everything around so the calipers were on the back of the fork legs and, uh, and then noticed immediately, oh, also I, I took the instruments off. They were mounted on the top triple clamp. So I took... I just threw the speedo out entirely and mounted the tack down in the fairing. So I had, took a bunch of weight off the front end and it was massively like a, like a really wicked tank slapper. It took about half the effort to get it back again. So it was a really, really good improvement. So I had a good instinct for stuff like that, like basic physics, basic leverage and basic ratios and stuff. Um, so that was that thing and uh and then uh I I had it that summer at the end of the summer I snuck onto the racetrack at Gimli north of Winnipeg which was a lucky for me it was a really good place to start trying to race because I could ride I rode off the track in a whole bunch of different corners on flat ground nothing to hit no fences no armco and uh I could just turn around and get back on the track and go so I got away with all kinds of stuff that would hurt me bad these days at most tracks and uh, and I was like okay well there's me on the racetrack and uh, went up the next day with my buddy Mark Fritzler who shot beautiful photographs and timed me and we knew the lap record was a minute 16 and with motorcycles so or sorry a minute 15 and uh so I'm going around there and I come in after a while and Mark says, Wow, oh, Ken, you're doing a minute sixteens. So I go, holy shit, one second, I can, I can make that up because I'm just kind of cruising here. So uh, uh, later, uh, later in the fall, I went up what must have been the last race of the season for that club, uh, whatever they called themselves, uh, the motorcycle racing club, road race club. Um, and I went up to watch a race because I'd never seen a race before. So, uh, uh, I just went up, I was wearing like a, I didn't even have a motorcycle jacket. I don't think I had a dress leather jacket with bare wrists and work gloves, leather work gloves, work boots on and jeans. No, I had wallabies, Clark's wallabies on because they were comfortable. I liked how they felt on my foot pegs. And um, I get up there to watch, and these guys are all flipping out because I got this bright orange, obvious race bike. But they're going, "Oh, you got to race! You got to race!" Because they've got all clapped out Triumphs and you know Nortons and things. And uh, you know, I had like this great bike. So uh, they finally, I said, "No, I'm not going to race. I got no leathers, no nothing. I, you know, I'm not going to kill myself for you guys." But um, they said, "Well, at lunch." follow Hank around. Hank Burkers had the lap record at the time on a, on a BMW. He's a good rider. 
So during the lunch break, I follow Hank around and, you know, he's cruising around steady pace and I'm following him and, and he goes faster, slowly, and then, you know, I'm just following and following and following and then we come in and, and everybody's jumping up and down. And they're going, oh, you guys set a new lap record. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> I can do better than that. So, uh, um, and that was with the bone stock Laverta, like starter in generator. And the generator is like this massive hunk of steel and copper. And the starter is another massive lump. It had a huge battery the size of a small car battery. Um, so I, I did a bunch of work over the winter. I, I got some high compression Vanolia pistons from Ricky Racer from Lance Wheel in Costa Mesa, California, California tuning gods. And uh, later to be the bane of my existence, the California tuning gods in general and, and magazine knowledge, which now would be the internet. But uh, <laughs> common, uh, common sense and common knowledge doesn't exist really. But um, uh, so I hit the track the next spring and I only owed the bank 400 bucks. Borrowed my dad's car, U-Haul trailer, had my Laverta in the back, had the starter off the generator. It didn't have an alternator, big honking generator. Small battery in and more compression and the thing was much hotter than it was when I'd previously been on the track. So. Now I got to ride this thing, and um, and I had leathers and stuff. And uh, uh, in my first practice session of my first ever race weekend, um, I got timed at I think it was I think it was a minute six, minute six seconds. So nine seconds off the lap record in my first ever practice session of my first ever race weekend. So I'm still impressed with that, but. Um, but things were pretty crude. The other competition, like the, the bikes they had, like, you know, I had a major, major advantage, um, technically with the bike. But, uh, unfortunately in that first practice session, the primary chain broke and it wasn't Laverta's fault. It was, uh, my fault for putting in new parts that didn't need to be there. Like the bike had 1500 miles on it and you know, things were just barely broken in. In reality, I know now, but at the time I thought, well, I don't have any experience. I don't know what's worn out or not. So we'll start off with as much fresh stuff in this motor as I can find. So I had a new cam chain, new primary chain, which was riveted by Reynold chain in Winnipeg and Turns out the guy didn't rivet the master link on the triplex chain properly and it unzipped at redline at full throttle and I was just about to shift out of third gear and and then choof and there's oil all over my legs and there's this half inch split across the motor. The motor is fucked and I was, you know, then I went from owing the bank $400 to a lifetime of debt after that serious debt. A couple of things helped me on the track. Um, uh, having a great bike, that was one. Like having, that Laverta really was a great bike for a rookie. Um, you know, for a big 750, it was, you know, heavy and stuff, but it was a, a good solid bike. And um, had great brakes, Brembo brakes all around, like nobody else had Brembo brakes in those days. I had triple Brembo brakes, perfectly consistent and all that. But there were some things other than the bike that really helped me ride fast. And uh, one was that I, I didn't use braking markers, like no visual cues, but the only visual cue is I kind of made sure I was on the track or online, but I wasn't looking for some place to now we turn the brakes on kind of thing. Um, I learned from racing slot cars, little electric cars that I used to build, and I raced those in my slightly earlier days, a few years earlier, wound my own armatures, all that kind of stuff. Um, I The cars were so fast that on a road circuit that I realized I couldn't even see my own car because it was just a blur, and I... I said to my buddy, you know, like, I can't even see this thing. Like, I think I'm driving it on rhythm because 
they use dynamic braking when you're off the throttle and obviously you know power and stuff so it wasn't just that you could pin it and have the car go around but um so i i'm there with my buddy driving this car and i say i'm i'm gonna try turning my back to the track just tell me if it's if i'm clearly screwing up here so i turned my back and uh drove three laps purely on rhythm and just freaked out and stopped but i proved it that it was just timing and um when I started racing motorcycles, um, that's basically, without thinking about it, that's what I was doing was I would ride the track smoothly and sort of establish a base timing. And then when I wanted to go faster, I'd just spin the record faster, kind of, if that makes any sense. But all of my braking, pitching, timings, there were strictly timings. There was no visual thing going on at all because to me it's stupid to look at something over here when you really want to be looking way over there um, you know if you're going through a fast corner you want to be looking way through the corner far through the corner not at the ground beside you so um, that was a big advantage uh, another one was growing up in Winnipeg Winnipeg streets were all concrete no asphalt on them and they got really polished and uh, they were slippery. And then also driving in the winter, like nobody had great tires back then. There wasn't really good winter tires. Everybody's on bias ply hockey puck tires. So uh, I, I was very, very comfortable with sliding, like two wheel drifts, four wheel drifts. I could go around a whole clover leaf with my MG with all the wheels steering straight. I ran around the whole clover leaf, just throttle and stuff like that. So I, I kind of kept, I had a, you know, I had a good feel for that. But uh, with motorcycles on concrete, they slide really nicely too. So I loved sliding. Like I loved sliding, it, you know, always at least coming out of a corner. And then later, once I got my skills up more, then I could slide into corners and through them and out. But uh, that was a whole quantum leap in skill to do that. But um, but to be comfortable, like to want to finish a corner sliding and stuff was fun and it turned out to be fast because other people weren't doing that. No one around me and then later when I raced in Brainerd, nobody was doing that there either. Um, but um, something I realized about that later on was with a motorcycle, if you're sliding a little bit, like a quarter inch rear slide or more, you cannot lose the front end if you're riding on ice or water or gravel. As long as you got a bit of a slide going on, you will not lose the front end. So it looks like a bit of a wild man thing to some people, but it's actually a safety thing. Sliding is safer than counting on traction and riding that front wheel through the corner, you know? So riding a front wheel through the corner like a Mark Mark is now, that's a quantum, several quantum leaps higher level of riding skill to do that because it's not easy and uh, it's much harder to save when it goes wrong on you. Um, if you're at lower speeds uh, on a motorcycle and you do lose your front end on gravel or something, uh, when in doubt, wick it out is the classic saying and it's so true. Just nail the throttle, back end slides, matches the front slide bike stands up right away like nothing even happened it's beautiful but um so i was sliding stuff and i, I had a i had a corner turn five at gimli it was a tight left hander and i couldn't gear for that corner like i didn't want to shift down through neutral to first because you're guaranteed to miss it on um, that that transmission had to, it just it didn't like shifting through neutral downshifting and second gear was kind of tall, so uh, I always kind of thought if you're going to make a mistake in gearing, gear tall and ride into your gearing, and guess what? You're going to go faster instead of having the gearing perfect in a lower gearing, you know? So um, this corner, I couldn't, couldn't do it in either gear really well, so I started, it was a tight corner, so I'd throw the bike down very hard and get on the throttle really early, 
and it was like I was fanning the clutch as a motocross guy, but I fanned the back wheel instead. So I'd slide it, uh, throttle slide, and slide the corner, and then that also accidentally gave me a wicked drive down the straightaway after that, and it turned into a riding technique that really all I was doing was trying to deal with my shitty gearing, and it evolved into that. There's a couple of things with the motorcycle business that uh, look a bit scary. Um, there doesn't seem to be as many young guys coming up, at least from my viewpoint. Uh, as a mechanic, uh, I don't have any young Kennys hanging around trying to get in and do anything just to hang out and learn stuff. I've, I actually haven't seen that, so that's a bit... I thought there'd be some young guys coming along like I was, you know. But uh, that's not happening. I don't know why as yet. Um, it might be because um, motorheadism isn't as promoted these days, in my opinion, as it was when I was a kid. And my favorite example of how motorheadism was promoted to us from little kids to adults was you had the Adams Family, a TV show, Monster Monsters, and then there was the uh, the Monsters, and uh, the Monsters were a little bit more lightweight, but uh, they had some cool things going on. Like one of the things that this is off topic entirely, but they had really good family values. Like everyone in the family, from little Eddie to Grandpa, had the same weight as far as their opinions went. But something else that was in the Munsters that I thought was great, but I was a motorhead kid, which now looking back was rather weird, is that uh, Herman, one of the key figures, and Grandpa both had, I think it was Ed Roth custom hot rods, like radical custom hot rods that they would drive in the show every every weekend whenever the Munsters was on. And... Uh, it's like, what the hell are those doing in there? But uh, motorheadism was shoved down our throats, and we didn't realize it when when I was you know when I was a kid. And uh, you don't get that as much now. In fact, there's a, quite a bit of negative stuff around motorheadism, like carbon emissions and fuel consumpting and uh, consuming and you know oil spills and blah blah. So there's a lot of negativity around it all, and it is, I'm pretty sure our vehicles are a major thing in destroying our planet, but uh, so the youth of today doesn't find it so attractive, but uh, so that's an aspect, I think, is the lack of promotion and of motorheadism. But something else with motorcycles is, um, and I this doesn't explain the youth thing, but the clientele for high-end motorcycles like Ducatis and Harleys, they're old men and they're getting older and a lot of them couldn't possibly pick up their bike if they dropped it and a lot of them can barely, barely push the bike around without dropping it and, and yet they're riding like these adventure bikes that are quite tall and they have all these bags and tons of stuff and God knows what they're going to do with all this stuff on their bikes but they have it. And you got these old guys that are frail and uh, maybe they were office guys their whole lives. They, they got no real power. They hadn't grown up being fit and physically active. Um, so, yeah, I, it doesn't look very good for the high-end motorcycle world. Like the Panigale V4 is, looks like a wonderful bike, but who's going to buy it? Uh, the old guys can buy it, but they can't ride it because... Most of them barely know how to ride, and uh, they only started riding when they were 60 or something. Um, and then the young guys don't have the money. Like, uh, you know, I, my apartment that I used to rent in Winnipeg cost 100 bucks a month, including utilities. It was wonderful. And uh, so my, my wage that I made compared to my life expenses was much more potent, and... Uh, these days, God help a young person trying to do, start out in the world, I don't know how they do it, but they sure as heck, there's not going to be too many buying 
expensive motorcycles, you know. Um, so I, I, I don't know how that's all going to shake out, other than the planet's going to explode anytime soon, and we'll be, and the problem will be done. But, <laughs> but, but uh, what else can I blather about? Anything else you can think of, Jason? At the um, moment, I would say uh, we haven't really covered your the tuning that you were doing, in, like the late '80s, early '90s. You one thing to cover. Um, well, you, you did briefly, but you didn't go into a lot of detail. So, like your work with Benoit Pilon and, and all that stuff, mm, and, okay. and racing at Daytona and, and in AMA, etc. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, the other thing was uh, like you finishing your racing experience. So you were kind of going through your techniques with the SFC, right. but then you know getting into when you you started with the GSXR and then mentioning the aerodynamics. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there I was uh, in my earlier days with the SFC La Verda at Gimli, you know, experimenting with things and sliding and accidentally, you know, using a, a patch for poor gearing turning into like a really good way to get better drive down a straightaway. And if you're sliding the back wheel, you can't lose the front wheel. So a safety thing. So I could go harder through a corner sliding and be perfectly safe compared to being in traction and not knowing when I was going to lose it or which end was going to go, you know. Um, so that was interesting and I, I did really well with that and then later on I was, uh, I, I sold those bikes and I, I was then racing a 1000cc triple Laverta, which was way more of a road bike but it was still it was fun to race. Uh, I raced it a couple of times, and uh, and uh, last race I had there was versus uh, the first real competition I'd had at my home track at Gimli, which was Frank Van was uh, there. Uh, he he was there. I think he was coming back from Eastern Canada, driving back out to Calgary here where he was living, but he was the Guyana road race champ uh, of of that time and they had quite a good strong racing scene there and he was running a TZ250 Yamaha like a 250 GP bike and uh, so we were racing together at Gimli and uh, I got a better start than he did so I was in the lead and you know I know that there's this guy there that's fast he's rumored to be fast on this surgical 250 and I'm on this like Battle Axe 1000 Laverta. And so I was starting to ride different lines. Like I wasn't riding my classic kind of wide in entry, you know, more tending to late apex kind of line. I started riding these choker lines because I didn't want him coming up the inside of me because I didn't know where he was. Nobody was giving us signboards back then and things like that. And uh, I had no pit crew. Um, but, uh, so I start writing these choker lines and I start pushing way deeper into the corner before I'm getting on the brakes hard. And, uh, uh, the Laverta had, you know, ground clearance issues. Like I'd be leaving ruts in the track, literally with the engine on one side or the other. And, um, so I'd go into the corner kind of tripoding on the engine case and the wheels <laughs> sliding. So I'd. I'd brake really, really late and then pitch it and the back end would be light so it would, it would come out naturally. And then so I'd kind of two-wheel drift into the corner on the engine cases and then, uh, and then there'd be this kind of mid-range where I'd kind of taper off brakes and then come into throttle and I'd just be basically coasting at that point and then the rest would be a throttle slide out of the corner. and. I, I rode the absolute wheels off that thing to stay ahead of this imaginary Frank Van Sertema who was behind me. And I think he really was, but I just had no idea where. Um, but um, that's where I really started working on, you know, sliding both wheels like into the corner and through the corner, not just finishing with the throttle slide, you know. And um, I thought that was pretty good and years later I talked to Yvonne Duhamel at uh, 
uh, some races in Eastern Canada. And I said, oh, you know, Yvonne, what I used to do, you know, this story I had this kind of thirds, like brake slide, coasting slide, throttle slide. And he goes, oh man, like that middle part, you got to get rid of that middle part. That's where you're out of control. And I go, well, it always felt like I was in control. We, uh, I ran the Laverta a number of times at some tracks that were still left, one up north of Edmonton here. Uh, was a, originally built as a Can-Am car track, and um, that no longer exists, but it was a really nice track to ride at. And then I, uh, I, at one point, 1985, I think, traded off my Laverta for, straight across, my many, much used Laverta on its third frame. I traded it straight across for a new 750 Suzuki GSXR. And that bike was a quantum leap compared to anything else out there. Guys were taking these production stock bikes and setting lap records at tracks where the previous lap record of only a year or two previous was set by full on 500 GP bikes, you know? So these production 750s were street bikes were doing better times in good hands, you know? So I had to have one of these because it was a big leap from my Laverta. Um, and I started racing that and uh, that thing scared the crap out of me. Like my Lavertas were too heavy to pick up the back wheel ever. Like they just, the front end would hop and chatter and stuff. And that was your braking limit was how much of that you could stand or you know, if you're hopping your front wheels in the air half the time. So it's not very effective for braking. But uh, the Suzuki uh, would pick up the back wheel. And so one time I'm going into the first turn and I'm braking hard. I got a poor start because I'd wheelied out at the start. Guy's coming. I'm braking and a guy swoops in in front of me. So I got to haul up some more brake. And the back end comes up. It feels like it's three feet in the air. It's probably only a foot in the air. But I just about shit myself and uh, run off the track and... <laughs> There's that, and then, uh, and the thing had way higher corner speed. It had seemingly unlimited ground clearance. Like, I'd be going through turn one at Gimli, and my knee would be stuck between the fairing and the track. I had nowhere else to go. It was like, wow, you know. For my riding position on the bike, I just, that's where I wanted to be, so it, it was kind of a weird thing. But it was fun, and then but that's when I first ran into suspension that didn't work because I'd already always been on Italian suspension that always worked pretty well, and then also brakes that were absolutely unpredictable. Uh, where I'd come from Brembo's for years, where they were absolutely flawlessly predictable, reliable, consistent, and you can't ride a fast lap times with brakes that you never know where they're going to be at, you know. So, yeah, that really messed me up, having shitty brakes. Um, and I, I only raced that bike for part of the 85 season and then part of the 80, 1986 season out at Westwood. And um, I, I sucked. I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't as fast as I used to be. Um, I'd had a, had a bad crash one time an alcohol related crash and um, out on the highway and um, I broke my head through my helmet I think I detached a retina because I think that's what gives you a blind spot in your vision and I broke my neck I found out just a few years ago so this all happened in 1981 and then um, broke my hands and some ribs and uh, that one messed me up uh, the breaking the neck thing could have done me because I broke it up here, so apparently that kills you. But the uh, what really messed me up was uh, my vision. It was uh, if I looked across the room, you would be there, and then you'd disappear, then you'd reappear on the other side of this blind spot, and then the blind spot was more or less in the middle of my left eye, and that's when you're looking for a distance, you're using the middle of your vision. So I had no depth perception and I could see, but I like my vision was missing like half the information. And um, it took me a long, long time 
to start to believe what I was seeing again. And you can't have that. Like if you're racing, doing something like that, you have to trust your senses. You can never question your senses. If you do, you're slow. You're just automatically slow. You have to be way beyond the pedestrian level to go really fast, you know? And that takes implicit trust in your instincts and senses and stuff. Um, did a bit of racing uh, at Brainerd in uh, near Minneapolis. I didn't have the lap record there, but I could run on it back in the day, which that was, I was pretty happy with that. That was with my 750 Liberta. I love riding there. Like that's a track that's fast. You gear the bike for as tall as it will pull. And you don't need any brakes until turn three on a 140 mile an hour bike, which my bike was. So you could go through turn one, which is a double, double apex sort of, well, there's one apex you use, but a sort of a double bank turn really easy. You could go through that with one hand at 140 miles an hour. Turn two was flat with little chatters all through it. And the bike was always just, you, if nobody was in your way, you could stay in it fully pinned, top gear, top speed, red line. And the bike would be just skating all through there. But that was pleasant and uh, wouldn't need brakes till turn three. But man, it was a nice, fast flowing track. And to me, racing ultimately should be fast. Like scratching around, hacking it out on a tight little circuit is just like, ah, why bother? <laughs> but racing really fast, that's ah, fun. Um, so there's some racing stuff riding stuff um, race tuning stuff um, I worked with uh, I didn't I didn't the only race tuning tuning I did when I lived in Manitoba was just for my own bike and then when I came out here uh, Pete Holzinger was an early friend I, I made uh, with motorcycles and uh, we rode together a lot and uh, and then he started racing and then when I quit racing I went and built his bike's motors and set up chassis and stuff and then helped him tune at the track. And uh, that went pretty well. Pete's a great rider, so he made my work look good. So if you're ever going to be a race tuner, you want to hook up with a great rider or else you're not going to look very good. <laughs> so always, yeah, that, that helped. Pete helped. Um, uh, I worked with, uh, I built stuff for lots of different people in those earlier race city days here in Calgary. Um, you know, I was able to make a few people a lot faster, like from mid pack or back of the pack to winning races. Uh, um, one guy, uh, struggling to think of his name, maybe I should just forget his name anyways, but, uh, a lot of guys would downshift too early, and uh, this guy was doing that, and I could tell because the small ends of his connecting rods were stretching. They're all ovalized. I go, man, Frank, you're, you're downshifting too, too soon, and just use your brakes for braking, and don't use the engine so much, and, uh, and then you'll be able to control the bike better. It won't be all squirming and hopping around on you, So, because uh, we didn't have slipper clutches then. and. Uh, so just this one little bit of advice and then a fresh motor and he started you know finishing top three in the races all of a sudden just for one little bit of advice so as a mechanic you can make the guys faster just by if you've got the luxury to be able to go and watch them ride at some parts of the track you can go holy smokes you should try this and try that and bam they're faster without any motor work whatsoever or chassis tuning I think I was getting a decent reputation around here. And then one of the nationals uh, that came through town, I'd spotted a guy that was, he was in the amateur class, uh, triple nine, red numbers, and he's just smoking everybody. He's way in the lead. He's really smooth. And I think, oh man, here's some, some old guy like me who's previously raced. He's got back into it after some years off. And he's just cherry picking. He should get the hell out of the rookie class and let somebody else win, you know. And that was it. You know, I was busy with Pete Holzinger's stuff. And then 
later I'm, I'm the next day I'm at home at my shop. I'm working out of home then. And this, this trailer pulls up and it's uh, Benoit Pilon is one of the guys with one of the bikes. It's his trailer. And this guy, this guy and his son wheel this bike up and say, you know, we heard you were mechanicing and, you know, do you think you could fix our bike for the next national out at Westwood? And uh, I go, yeah, yeah, for sure I can. And, uh, so which one of you guys is the rider? Because there's this dad and there's this little kid. And, well, the kid says, I am. I go, what? How old are you? And he's, he says, oh, I'm 19. I go, oh, okay. And it uh, was Jacques Gannett Jr. And uh, he was the loveliest guy. Uh, you know, he barely had any English, at least speaking-wise. And none of us, when we're learning a language, like you'll understand a language long before you dare to try to speak it because you don't want to shame yourself with your bad pronunciation or something. But, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, I worked. I did a crazy, crazy all-nighter on that thing. Uh, I can't remember what all was wrong. I, I just don't remember. Was, I think it was transmission stuff. And, and then while I was in there, I just saw the whole motor was so tired, like the, all the valves were leaking. This was a 88. Suzuki GSXR, like the short stroke big bore one, and it had bigger valves and stuff, but but air cooled, air oil cooled still, but it was making so much heat that the uh, if you pictured the head upside down, the spark plug hole in the middle of valve seats, the whole combustion chamber was was melting down into the spark plug hole, so all four valve seats were tipping down toward the spark plug hole and needed to be radically recut. And the main reason I don't have any hair is because I had to do this with new A valve seat cutters. So those things, if you're lucky enough to not start them chattering when you're using them, uh, if the valve seat's square, you can trim up that valve seat, you know, do top and bottom angles and stuff like that, and maybe come up with a credible job, but not likely. But when the valve seats are crooked, the cutter starts to cut at the high part, and the pilot is only four millimeters thick or something, quite thin, and you start the cutter going really lightly, and it torques off of the high part, bends the pilot over and then cuts the valve seat crooked another way instead of the way it already is. So you have to load the cutter shaft with your thumb in a direction that you imagine with the torque loading is going to end up making that seat square. So try doing this at 3 in the morning knowing that they want to drive to Westwood the next day. And so you're working all night it's three in the morning, you're cutting valve seats with new way cutters. Man, like loss of hair. And if it wasn't for CBC having Brave New Waves, that radio show saved my life because um, I can't do smart work listening to stupid music. Hence, I've quit a number of jobs over radio stations where they play like tailgate music, that cousin fucking kind of stuff. Uh, can't listen to that and do smart work. So Brave New Waves played like amazing stuff, like really high level music beyond my understanding. And it really raised me up and helped me get through very trying times on several occasions. And this was one of the worst was with Gannett's getting that motor ready. And, but then we get out to Westwood and here I get to work with the young Jacques Gannett Jr. for the first time. And oh my God, he is the most talented guy I've ever seen or definitely ever worked with. Uh, uh, Westwood's a very difficult track. It's 3D, it's up and down and lefty, righty, cambers, all kinds of stuff. And it rains a lot there. Um, difficult track to figure out for anybody. And I permanently sucked it there. I only raced there four times maybe. And uh, yeah, I was slow there. Uh, but um, Jacques gets there, and within a handful of laps, he's on the lap record pace. Just genius, like genius level rider. He's never seen the place before. 
The locals set their fast times. They have Wednesday night practices and race weekends. They got every Wednesday they can go there and burn up tires. And uh, Jacques is on their pace like in a handful of laps, like just crazy how good he was. And um, and he was really happy with the bike. And then he'd come in and I'd go, well, there's something else I haven't looked at and pull out the air filter and it's all soaked with oil from uh, a tip over somewhere earlier in the season. So I put in a fresh air cleaner, the bike goes better. And Jacques says, Kenny, every time you touch the bike, it goes faster. <laughs> so it was really nice to be complimented by this genius young guy. So I ended up uh, hooking up with the Gannett family and moving out east to, uh, they were based out of Laval. And so I, I worked with them for, uh, hmm, it's hard to say, uh, sort of a season and a half, I guess, um, until I, I blew things up by uh, socially destroying myself, which isn't really going to be part of this conversation, I don't think. But, uh, but uh, Jacques was so nice to work with. Like, it's wonderful to work with a guy that you give him a bike that's great, and then he, he finds another 10 or 20% beyond what you handed him. Like, he just used up everything and more. Brilliant rider. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I did some other tuning with his brother, Hugh. Uh, in English, his name is Hugo. Um, he was he was good, but not he was a big guy, so he had big shoulders to drag through the wind. And he wasn't anywhere near the same level as Jacques, but very nice guy to work with. Lovely guy. Um, also worked with. Um, oh, oh come on, brains. Um, so Jacques and uh, yeah, and uh, later I worked with uh, Benoit Pilon. So. Uh, and um, he was another really wonderful guy to work with uh, and hang out with. A really fun, happy guy. He was almost too happy to be a racer because I think you have to have some kind of angst that's driving you so you just want to destroy everybody else on the track. And Ben was too happy for that, I think. He was too well-balanced and happy guy. But great rider, lovely rider. And... Um, I worked with uh, Ben, with, that was with the OW01 Yamaha, that was a very good bike, that was quite a quantum leap in street bikes, or super bikes, um, was the first of the perimeter chassis, carbs up at a very steep angle, better induction, really good cold air inlets to the air box, uh, fuel tank which is basically a cylinder, vertical cylinder, so as the fuel load went down it didn't change weight bias front to rear, it just got easier to ride. You know, a whole bunch of really, really smart things and a good stiff frame, brilliant bike. Um, deeply flawed by the five-valve combustion chamber, though. You couldn't get any compression out of the thing because of all these valve pockets and compression's king. That's how you make horsepower, you know, so... Um, yeah, that was that was too bad. It was a great bike with a, a reliable but down-on-power motor. Uh, I think even the air oil-cooled Suzuki probably made more power, although we, we didn't commonly have dynos back then. I never saw a dyno with anything I built back in those days. Some things, I, 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 I feel bad with Ben in particular that I feel like I let him down on a couple of areas. Um, maybe I'm innocent and maybe it's just because of experience I know some things now that I couldn't know beforehand but we went down some paths with suspension Dale Dale Rath Bone or Born Rathwell Dale Rathwell was kind of a suspension guru he was a guy people were following in Canada at that time and uh, maybe in the States too but we were running the bike very low, the ride height very low. And our idea was the bike's lower, the mass is more aligned with the axles, it's easier to turn, bang, bang, you know, um, which could have some merit. But a fatal flaw of that was the swing arm angle. And uh, the 750 doesn't make huge power, but it makes some. And what was happening was in mid-corner, 
the swing arm was actually angled up from the pivot to the back wheel, like the chassis was down so low that the chain line was now pulling the back wheel off the ground, basically. So Ben was having wheel spin problems and, you know, losing traction halfway through the race and then going backwards through the field. And I'm, you know, hopelessly competitive. And uh, I'm on the sidelines going, what the, what the hell's going on? What, what's he doing? And, uh, you know, years later, I, I realized that it was my chassis setup problem. That's what was wrecking it for him was we, we didn't run a decent swing arm angle and the chain to the swing arm angle, it's a, there's a very critical sweet spot there where the suspension is fairly neutral from the chain pull or either pro or anti-squat and uh but um uh you know it was my chassis setup that was ruining the traction part way through the race and i always was thinking it was him my rider ben but it wasn't him it was me so i feel terrible about that and then also a similar thing was uh i we were running kit cams and kit springs and stuff like that in the motor and uh I wasn't checking valve seat pressures back then when I built a motor and like seating spring pressures and uh, Ben was, we were eating up valves constantly and I, I thought he's just wringing the neck off this motor all the time and he's got to start not screaming it so much because the, the revs are destroying the valves and I'm getting sick and tired of doing valve jobs especially with these damn new way cutters still. And uh, I blamed him for that, but once again, that was my fault, and that was strictly my fault. I was just too stupid to realize that I should be checking valve, valve spring pressures, not just trusting the factory, you know, you stick these springs in and that. You still got to shim them and set up seat pressures. And uh, I'm pretty sure now that the valves were floating because I just wasn't running enough seat pressure. So once again, Ben, apologies, my man. <laughs> We tried, but uh, your own mechanic was, was slowing you down there on a couple of big points. So, sorry about that, Ben. Um, yeah, so it was Ben Pilon. I did some other work with uh, Gannett's um, at various races in the States. Uh, we did Daytona a couple of times, different ways. Daytona is fun. It's like uh, you like in this big fishbowl of motorcycle racing and this the whole world is out on the outside you don't have a clue what's going on you're just in total motorhead fishbowl and uh it's also like a trade show so i got to meet the top guys of a whole bunch of different things like i got i got uh, yoshi from kahin to get me some special needles straight from kahin that i couldn't buy anywhere else and got them to my own spec and oh man all kinds of cool things and met different industry guys that it was it was really like a trade show with a motorcycle race it was a super cool event that uh, the trade show aspect was wonderful but it's a brutal event on a race team because most teams don't have a a decent budget and uh, uh, most teams blow their whole racing budget at Daytona and then they're screwed for the whole rest of the racing season because it's a you're there for quite a few days and it's long track, and all its screaming revs, it just wears equipment out. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend to not go to Daytona. Avoid Daytona, it just eats up equipment. It's gonna cost you money. You won't be any further ahead. You'll pop out broke and destitute at the end of the race week. <laughs> and then outside the racetrack, when we dared to go outside the racetrack, is pretty freaky. There's all these bankers dressed up like bikers and long-haired bikerish looking people with with like black stocking things on with razor cuts in them um, looking like maybe they wanted to be strippers in a 80s strip club or something I, I don't know what it, all these weirdos are on the street it's like oh, let's go back to the racetrack fish tank now and let's just be motorheads again but there was that uh, and uh, um, did some tire testing for Michelin at uh, Texas World Speedway before that for uh, helping Michelin get ready for Daytona to select tires. And um, that was kind of a cool thing. That was with uh, 
Jacques Gannett again, and really cool. Uh, one of the cool guys on our team that time uh, was um, uh, Mike Velasco, who used to tune for Freddie Spencer, a really high-level tuner, a really good natural mechanic, like very good. Like we were both on the same wavelength. It was very cool. Uh, we had a mutual respect thing, and we both thought of things the same way. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, I really enjoyed working with Mike, and it was like I got to work with a hero. So it was a very cool thing, and I I kind of realized I felt more comfortable about where I was technically after working with him because you know because I was thinking in a similar way. So that was cool. Um, but we found some things uh, there, and uh, also we were at Laguna Seca. And, uh, oh, let me finish with, uh, sorry, Texas World Speedway Tire Testing, Michelin. So there's us there. I think there's a couple of other, one or two other sort of superbike North American teams. But the Ducati team was there. And I can't remember who the famous rider was who was their team manager, but Giancarlo Falapo was the rider. He's a wild man, like... Uh, these are like the most exotic motorcycles I'd ever seen. They're carbon everywhere. Nobody had carbon on their motorcycles back then, but these Ducatis were littered with carbon and titanium and amazing, amazing bikes. And uh, uh, Giancarlo Falapa wiped out one of them. He was in shorts, little short shorts, embarrassingly short shorts, in a t-shirt doing big giant wheelies around the parking lot in the pits and uh and he threw one of the ducatis down the road while doing that really expensive wonderful bike and uh, we also we also went to laguna seca and uh raced there and uh with mike velasco again and with Gannett's and uh, uh that's where i found out how mickey mouse some of the supposedly top flying teams can be uh not that they all are but they certainly can be so uh, Gary Medley from Muzzy's was borrowing Cosman uh, triple clamp offsets off us for setting trail on the steering and uh, he's, he says and Scott Russell's riding their bike and he comes back Gary keeps coming back and borrowing different different offset pieces and uh, he says I don't know Scott doesn't like any of them like I don't know what I'm what I can do and so uh, Mike Velasco says, so Gary, uh, what are you doing? Like, show me how you're putting these pieces in. And Gary comes over to our bike and he goes, well, I put them in like this. And Mike goes, well, uh, Gary, you're putting them in backwards. So uh, <laughs> start over. <laughs> so yeah, this is like a supposedly top tuner on the, on the AMA circuit. Like, oh my God, pretty low level. There were some other guys that were brilliant, though. I, I got to meet some really, uh, really brilliant guys, other mechanics and stuff. Yeah, it was really fun to meet and then just kind of talk to each other and totally geek out about weird techno stuff that no one on Earth should actually care about. I think uh, I kind of stepped back in with uh, working with uh, Gannett's and the Gannett family, actually, Hugues and, and Jacques and working with uh, Mike Velasco, brilliant Mike Velasco, at Laguna Seca. Um, yeah, it was neat, neat experience. I got to meet Jewel Hendricks and uh, uh, Kevin Cameron. Those guys were our tech inspectors. And uh, such nice guys and such an easy tech, easiest tech on earth to blow through if you got your shit together. Just have a nice little chat and on. But, uh, I thought I was, I was thinking about going and doing some races in Japan with Mike um, but we just I just had a, a new baby at that point our, our Max boy Sharon and I had Max and I thought well you know I could look around me and see you know lots of the race mechanics that I could see around me had either pharmaceutical problems, cocaine problems, or alcohol problems, uh, dysfunctional relationships, on the road 10 months of the year kind of thing. Like, I just thought, ah, 
this is kind of this is something I've wanted for a long time in my life is to be a top level race tuner and in some ways it's still like the most fascinating thing but but the downside is is like a shit lifestyle <laughs> so I I think that's where that was my that's where I first actively pulled back on my race tuning involvement um, I realized that I'd rather be dad and be a good partner husband sort of guy than than be some guy in some motel room somewhere else on the planet uh, nursing a hangover and getting up and working on bikes again and uh, some of the some of the aspects of working on the motorcycles that people don't know about or think about is the race gas is so toxic. I know it probably still is, but it sure was back then. Like, you know, if you smelled enough race gas in a day, you'd have the most horrible sickness and headaches, and it was horrible, horrible stuff to work around. I'm pretty sure it's cancer in a can that stuff. So I was happy to get away from that. But mainly, I just wanted to be dad. So that was the end of my ramping up my levels of race tuning and working with better and better people on bigger and bigger scenes. And then I just w withdrew back to a uh, local level and um, worked more at uh, regular motorcycle shops and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, somewhere along the way, I got back into working on Ducatis, which was quite wonderful. Um, I've always loved my Italian engineering, and um, so there I was working with the newer Ducatis, and uh, nice to get back at them. And in 2007, I got drawn back into racing again, blew away a whole summer traveling with Ducati. Uh, that time we were running a rather kind of a lame bike, the Paul Smart replica as a full-on race bike versus the Buells and the BMWs, some model of, but all the bikes had to be air-cooled. And uh, there was a sort of a 3.4 ratio thing where like our bike, we could easily make it weigh, or 3.8, we could easily make the bike weigh 380 pounds and um, easy to make it that light. And I went to minimum weight, figured that's the best way to get around the track no matter what power you got. So we went that way to minimum weight and then the most power we could make at minimum weight was 100 horsepower. So um, in our dual spark 1000 cc motors, we made them up, upsize them to 1100s, uh, bored them and, uh, and then I did a bunch of machining on pistons and heads and cylinders uh, to change combustion chamber shapes and up the compression ratio. And um, uh, that that was a fun tuning sort of exercise. Um, it was successful. I just tried to, we didn't have any time for dyno stuff. So they got horsepower checked at the end of the races. And that's the only time I saw any kind of dyno curve. And um, I tried to make as much power as I could. Like I tried to make my 100 horsepower is low as far back down the rev uh, revs as possible and uh, real you know thinking that okay if I make the power down low this thing's going to come off the corner harder and it'll reach top speed sooner the longer we have at top speed well that's a faster lap time and uh, so we did that and I, I Guy Martin gave me a little award it was kind of cute for best uh, power to the, you know, the limit to the, on the dyno limit. So the thing on the graph would go up to 100 horsepower, and I don't know what revs because it only showed speed because it wasn't the full dynamometer setup. And, uh, but it went up to 100 horsepower early, about a third of the way through the revs, and went just like, a, like as if I'd used a ruler to whoosh, draw 100 horsepower to redline it was it was fucking brilliant but it was uh it was all guesswork and experience and uh luckily by that point i had a lot of experience and uh something i have to credit for 
race tuning experience was of all things building hot rod harley motors because uh uh, I had four years of doing that, doing machining and building motors, and uh, it's really cool to have a whole bunch, a long stream of the same motors. So this was the Evo Big Twin uh, 1340cc stock Harleys, you know, 80 inch motors. And uh, so I could build them all kinds of different ways, and we had a very good dyno room at that point, and one of the best room in town, most stable air, stuff like that. and. Um, I could see the effect of every change I made and build motors different ways and um, that really really helped me in my really advanced my understanding of engine building and engine tuning and race tuning and stuff so that helped a lot in the Ducati program because I still had my my ratios in my mind and different things on how I was going to build this motor so and I have to thank the Harley experience for that but uh, that was tough, a tough season. Um, we had some major mechanical issues like titanium valves that I didn't actually need or want, but I got talked into running. It had some kind of coating on the stems that was just brutal. It wore out the valve guides. It wore out intake valve guides that normally would never wear on a motor. In one day, they would be worn out to the point where like the end of the valve stem moved about an eighth of an inch or it should be just, you know, not moving. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal. There was issues that t team, you know, private issues and marriage issues and, oh my God, lack of budget like any race team has. And man, it was a tough season. So that was my last race tuning season. And I was sighing for three months after that ended just because, it was so exhausting and so stressful. I, I don't have really any desire to go racing like that again. I, I, I think I'd be happy to go work with Andre Davizioso and the Ducati team, but uh, once again, that's a huge team. Big teams, it's not much fun. You're just a guy noodling away on some teeny little thing while somebody else is doing that. I, I'm a control freak. I like to have pretty much everything in my hands, but, but Dovey's a fucking wonderful guy, I'd, I'd like to work with him, but who knows, I uh, don't think that's going to happen. How about the 749 problem? So, like, I quit having motorcycles in 86, the end of 86, um, replaced it with mountain bike racing, got healthy, happy, out of debt, life was wonderful, um, and then... Along came, uh, there was this 749R Ducati at 2004 that was a trade-in at the Ducati shop I was working at. And uh, I never thought much of them. I thought, ah, it's just like the little bike, you know. I really liked the 999R. That was a sweet ride. Um, but I sort of set up, to, cleaned up this little 749R and set up the levers to suit me and various other adjustments to suit me personally. And then I took it out for a ride, and it was like, oh my god, this thing is wonderful. This is the sweetest bike on the planet. It's surgical. It's like, it's like a 250 GP bike with a 750 V-twin beautiful motor. It's like, wow. So um, I started to fall madly in love with this bike, which you should never do. Never, ever do that. Um, and... Uh, so I suggested to my wife that I should, you know, I wanted to buy this bike. And I'd just come off another one of my OCD boat building projects and uh, just barely finished that up, which was another money gobbling thing that, uh, you know, I, I'm blind, I conveniently blindly ignore the expensive things when I get into these projects. But uh, so I basically split up with my family over buying this Ducati and just went, oh yeah, I'll, you know, I'll just do that. And that was a really bad idea. Um, but uh, so I bought this bike for a good price and then I spent more than that amount again hot rodding it. I had a beautiful Rio Vinci titanium pipe I found for it and uh, tapered head tubes and just beautiful workmanship and 
the same level as uh, a Kropovich or somebody like that. And uh, went through the motor, race compression, all through the whole chassis suspension. That bike is something else. Like, it's got Olin suspension. Yeah, lots of bikes have Olin suspension, but that one's got the right valving. It's like racetrack valving comes in the suspension. Like, it's dialed for my weight. I don't know, you know, 160 pound guy is riding aggressively. It's perfect. Uh, steering head angle you can change and you can change the trail with the stock components in the front end the other ducatis you could change the head angle but you'd have to buy different triple clamps to change your trail settings um, slipper clutch stock um, titanium rods and valves and uh, just an exquisite bike and uh, real rev happy light crank uh, light flywheel close ratio tranny like just a bike from the gods that I still I, I I I had to sell it before I went I've been around the mountain of speeding tickets and jail time and warrants and insurance problems I like I just I don't need to go there anymore but I was starting to go there all over again and I went oh my god like I'm pretty stupid but I think I'm just bright enough to realize that I gotta stop I got a fire sale, this bike. I sold it to some guy in Australia for 15 grand and I had more than 30 into it and not including any labor, just parts, you know? Yeah, and I never really got to ride the bike. I got to ride it in an untuned fashion for about 30 Ks. Never got to tune the Nemesis ECU in or nothing. And yeah, I, I have a bit of regrets there, but I'm happier to be off the drug train and uh, having a family again. <laughs> Briefly tried working at a shop again and it didn't go very well. Um, I It was a lot of different brands of bikes, a lot of different models, really frustrating. You're never expert. You're, you're only seeing this thing the first time while you're working on it and trying to be efficient for a reasonable time spent on a job is really hard on the first time you see something and when it's always first time. Anyways, I got offered a stress reducing pay reduction on that job and I thought that was one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. This guy could, he could run a religion with logic like that, but <laughs> and he could do well. But uh, yeah, I just kind of went, oh uh, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll talk to you tomorrow about that. Uh, you know, anyways, I rode my bicycle down the road in the middle of the afternoon on a perfectly sunny afternoon when, fuck, it feels good to get out of there. What am I going to do? <laughs> I don't want to work at any other shops in town. They're even worse, you know, like, what am I going to do? So I thought, well, I guess I'll just start working at home again, my own little shop. So I just hope I still have some kind of reputation that maybe people will bring their bikes to some guy, random guy working out of his shop at home. So I started doing that again and that's been wonderful. It's been great. I get to listen to really good music. I get to have really good lighting. Um, a drawback is I can't, there's there's no silly ass banter. I can, there's no humor in my shop. I can't joke around with anybody. So it's just me by myself. CJSW radio station saves my butt. I got some kind of human input there. But, uh, so anyway, that's what I looks like I'm going to be doing for the rest of my days, uh, is working in my own little shop, which is pretty happy. I'm working on some cool projects, an old race bike I built for one of my best customers in 1989. It's back in my hands again to make it into a track day bike. And, uh, that's, that's really cool. Uh, I've got a 749R out there right now. Ho -ho to try not to fall in love with. So I'm pretty happy to work on one of those again. Um, so that's my own little scene uh, as I go drifting off into the sunset. Um, maybe there's some other grand exploits to come, but I don't know what they'd be just yet. And for the motorcycle business in general, um, it seems to me that since the advent of Hondas back in the day where you you meet the nicest people on a Honda from those magazine ads back then. 
you're getting more and more of these nice people and that's all there is left anymore. There's hardly any motorcyclists left anymore in my brutal opinion. And it seems to be what I would consider a really large amount of posers, like people that only seem to own the motorcycles so they can wear the leather jacket legitimately. And I think, I, maybe I'm wrong, I really hope so, but it, it seems like it's all about the look and the pose and not many people are really riders, you know, but uh, like I say, hopefully I'm wrong and I'm probably from a jaded old guy viewpoint, but uh, um, you know, like motorcycles used to get more powerful, faster, better, and they still are in a lot of ways, but, but who's going to ride these things? Like the youth of today aren't really showing up in droves. Uh, the old guys are old and most of them barely know how to ride as it is. They hold up traffic on the highway. That never used to happen. A motorcycle holding up traffic on the highway, like hilarious. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I, don't know, I don't know what the future of motorcycles and this business is going to be. And along with, you know, concerns for the, um, you know, carbon emissions and all that stuff too. It's like, we got to start changing our ways to be healthier, to sustain life on this planet. But uh, I don't know what all the radical changes are going to be, but... Uh, I uh, I don't think I'd want to be a big player in the motorsports industry because it looks I don't see I don't see much future in it. But I'm a negative guy, so uh, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Might what might be the future or a way to go or what's going to happen? MotoGP is an area that I see wonderful uh, advancement in, even though that too is wildly impractical in this day of trying to save our planet. Uh, but, uh, you know, the level of riding, Mark Marquez has so, so pushed the level up. He's made everyone else scramble to come to his level. But a guy that can, like, ride a bike that isn't competitive, like his Honda was last year, and win the championship by pushing the front end so brutally that he's had 27 crashes in one season and almost all of those front end tuck crashes and he saves all these front end white balls. Like he's down, 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 gets it back, carries on, sometimes doesn't even drop a position. Like phenomenal riding. It must take an amazingly powerful mind to deal with the stress of pushing at that level for a whole race time after time. Danny Pedrosa's results last year more reflect where, where the bike really was at, you know, and how hard Mark Marquez was pushing beyond what the bike could reasonably do. Uh, so his riding's amazing, uh, and my beloved Andre De Vizioso has really, really opened up his mind and really been riding, so I'm, it's wonderful to see he and Ducati come back back to the fight again and uh, so some advancements there but uh, yeah I don't know really what we're gonna look at for advancements or where we're gonna go from this point on um, yeah I just don't have a clue I'm just kind of getting along day by day doing my mechanicing but something that I would love to see the end of is I would love to see the electronics back out of the picture like I think it's ruining our lives uh, and it's taking a lot of things out of the hands of the small guy or the owner. But uh, once again, I'm a mechanic. I'm not an electronics technician. I'm a jaded old guy. But uh, I know that it's nicer to tune fuel just with tweaking buttons or something or, you know, changing a map on a computer. But uh, I personally like changing jets. I kind of like that. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know, I don't know where it's going. I think a good thing to do would be to make great bikes that are affordable and simple so that a young guy could buy them and enjoy riding them and afford to keep them running. And uh, nobody needs ballistic bikes on the street. Like, I had trouble keeping my driver's license with 75 horsepower. Like, what do you do with 214 horsepower? You know, like, you got to be kidding, like, on the street. 
you know, who needs that? Um, it's just, uh, you know, anyway, but for the young guys, I guess these Ducati scramblers, um, BMW's got some new bike I saw at the show that's several different models of a pretty nice looking bikes, uh, looking fairly simple and like a basic motorcycle again. I, that, that's what, like, we should be riding basic motorcycles uh, and they should be good ones uh, so that somebody can actually enjoy them and maybe actually want to carry on with motorcycles in their life instead of just forget it, I can't afford that or I can't ride that, you know. So maybe that's the direction to go is, is get simpler and smaller and cheaper, but still use good geometry, as good components as you can and to make it a, a good machine, but still have a profit, but sell more. Sell cheaper bikes, but sell more, a lot more. And then there'd be less carbon emissions from less monster trucks.